Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support us on Patreon if you can. There are links in the description. Today we are going to discuss an innovative solution to what we will call transplanetary transit time. We are all watching for the SpaceX Starship to make its first suborbital flight. Suborbital flight does not take as much delta V as an orbital flight does. A suborbital flight does not achieve the horizontal velocity necessary to stay in orbit. Like an arrow fired from a bow, or an elliptical orbit, where the periapsis is inside the planet. But a suborbital flight can reach an altitude higher than some satellites, and a re-entry velocity higher than orbital velocity. This is a good way to evaluate a flight and re-entry system since the ship will come back down close to where you predicted, without any action being necessary to deorbit. Alan Shepard was the first American to go into space, and he was on a suborbital flight. No re-entry burn was necessary. Yuri Gagarin, on the other hand, had already achieved orbit on his groundbreaking flight 23 days before Alan. Gagarin did need a deorbit burn to come back on time. The suborbital SpaceX Starship will be on a Shepard-style flight, not a Gagarin. If something goes wrong, it will still come back to Earth. The SpaceX Starship is being developed for one purpose, to allow humans to inhabit other worlds. We often think of just the Moon and Mars as potential homes for humanity. But besides my personal favorite, Mercury, the moons of other planets are excellent places for our first off-world colonies. The gravity is low, making it easy to get to and from space, and cities can be built underground to protect from radiation. The Earth has only one moon, and Mars has two smaller ones. But Jupiter has over 50 fairly large moons, with four of them being larger than Earth's moon, and many more much smaller ones. Saturn has one moon larger than Earth, Titan, and its atmosphere would shield us from radiation. Saturn also has over 50 smaller moons. Uranus has five good-sized moons, and Neptune has two, with Triton being close to the size of our moon. Both Uranus and Neptune are rich in resources. Giant ships could aerobrake in the atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune, scooping up tons of precious helium-3 to provide power and warmth to the worlds past the orbit of Earth. Through the miracle of a neutronic fusion, if we could just get there. Chemical rockets, like those powering the Space Launch System and the SpaceX Starship, can get us efficiently to our moon, and just barely, to Mars. But they cannot open the rest of the solar system to us in a reasonable time frame. Even the journey to Mars using a SpaceX Starship will take up to eight months. That's okay for the founders of a future colony. These will be people at least 50 years of age, who are willing to dedicate their lives to the future of humanity. But to inhabit the worlds beyond Mars, we will need a more efficient transportation system. Chemical rockets are limited by physics to usually less than 500 seconds of specific impulse. Remember that specific impulse is a measure of rocket engine efficiency. The higher your specific impulse, the less mass of propellant you have to carry. To get to the same destination. If we use our rocket equation and set our initial mass as 1, using 10 kilometers per second as an arbitrary delta V needed, we can program in the specific impulse of methane and hydrogen powered rockets and see that we will need 89 to 93 percent of our ship mass to be propellant. This is not very efficient. We could increase our specific impulse by using ion drives discussed in this lesson, but ion drives need a lot of power. We might try to get our power from a combination of solar and fuel cells. This could work between the Earth and the Moon, and definitely on the way to Venus or Mercury. But ion drives have low thrust, so we would probably need a combination of high-thrust chemical engines for people 
and low thrust, more efficient ion engines for cargo. But this won't work well getting to Mars or beyond. We find that leaving the orbit of Earth rapidly reduces the power from our solar panels, and that carrying chemicals like hydrogen and oxygen to power fuel cells is actually less efficient than just burning that propellant through a rocket engine. Then we have the problem of thrust limitations. Ion engines, while very efficient, cannot process much mass. Remember that the force or thrust produced is defined by the exhaust velocity times the mass propellant flow. No matter how high your specific impulse, if your mass propellant flow is low, you won't get much thrust. Even applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, probably the best combination of thrust and efficiency right now, can only put out a few hundred newtons per engine. We could use a lot of these engines and scale them up but that would add a lot of mass that we would have to accelerate. And we still need power to make them work. If we can't rely on solar, and chemical is not efficient, that leaves us with nuclear. A nuclear electric propulsion concept for a flight to Callisto was worked out by the Glenn Research Center at NASA in 2003. A link to this paper is included in the description. The mission was called HOPE, for Human Outer Planet Exploration. The paper chose Callisto as a destination. Callisto is the second largest moon of Jupiter and is a prime candidate for human habitation. It is almost the same size as Mercury, though less dense. Jupiter is on average about 588 million kilometers from Earth. This is about five times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Callisto orbits 1.9 million kilometers from Jupiter, putting it outside the powerful radiation belts created by Jupiter's strong magnetic field. The gravity on Callisto is a little less than 13% that of Earth, making it very similar to our own moon. Unlike the Earth's moon, however, Callisto is covered in water ice. These conditions, and the availability of in-situ resources, make Callisto the best candidate for habitation of all Jupiter's moons. But going to Jupiter will require nuclear power, so the HOPE mission was going to use uranium dioxide and tungsten metal pellets in nuclear reactors. These would be gas-cooled 2,000 Kelvin reactors, producing megawatts of electrical and thermal power. The mission would have crew, cargo, and tanker vehicles, all using the power from their reactors to operate magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters with hydrogen ion propellant. These thrusters would operate at 2.5 megawatts each producing a specific impulse of 8,000 seconds. If we put this into our equation, we see that with such a high specific impulse, only 12% of our ship would have to be propellant to produce a delta V of 10 kilometers per second. The conversion efficiency is assumed to be 64.5%, meaning that if you put in 100 watts of electricity, you get back 64.5 watts of propulsion power. Each thruster was estimated to have a mass of 263 kilograms. These engines would power three vehicles. These would be the piloted Callisto transfer vehicle with artificial gravity and comfortable habitation for the crew, as well as fully automated cargo and tanker vehicles. The mission plan included a crew of six who would establish the outpost and set up a propellant production facility near the Asgard asteroid impact site, where our probes have found lots of water ice. There would be three different lander types for crew descent and ascent, surface habitation, and propellant production. The propellant production lander would include bulldozer-like rovers to collect water ice for processing. The propellant processor would have its own 250 kilowatt reactor which would power its own systems and recharge the rovers. The tanker could stay in orbit around Callisto, providing the return propellant needed to get the crew home when the mission is complete. The tanker would have a reactor producing 6.4 megawatts of power, and it would have been launched from L1 first, achieving orbit around Callisto before the crew left Earth. The tanker and cargo ship would take a low thrust trajectory, spiraling out from their station at the Earth-Moon L1 point and move into a direct heliocentric transfer orbit to Jupiter. 
then a propellant-saving spiral end to orbit Callisto. The crew would take a higher thrust trajectory to reduce transit time. After spending four months exploring Callisto, the crew would use the tanker to refill the propellant tanks in the PCTV and use a high thrust return to Earth. The entire mission, with nuclear power and advanced propulsion, was estimated to be about five years. Five years of traveling through space to spend four months exploring the surface of a new world. This is because while nuclear electric propulsion is very efficient, it has very low thrust. It takes a long time to accelerate and decelerate your spaceship. Is there a faster way? John Slough thinks there is. Mr. Slough designed what he called the fusion-driven rocket. Whereas most fusion projects are optimized to produce power on Earth, his system is optimized for in-space propulsion. Fusion is the process of crushing together two nuclei until the repulsive electromagnetic force pushing them apart is overcome by the much stronger but shorter distance strong nuclear force that binds quarks in a nucleus and holds protons and neutrons to each other. Once this distance is closed, the nuclei slam together, forming a new nucleus. To brush up on fusion power, review this series of lessons. Mr. Slow chose to encase his propellant in a solid lithium shell. This metal would be formed into a foil, and then the pellet would be imploded with powerful magnetic fields, creating fusion conditions. This could be used for propulsion by using three lithium metal shells around the target material, like deuterium. A powerful magnetic field would pulse. The metal would react to the powerful magnetic field by compressing inward in every direction, forming a thick blanket that compresses the plasmoid to fusion conditions. This metal blanket would absorb almost all of the photonic, neutron, and other particle radiation created in the fusion reaction, protecting the ship. The metal would be superheated, vaporized, and ionized. Magnetic fields would guide this propellant plasma out the back of the rocket. This would provide an exhaust velocity of up to 30,000 meters per second, which would be a specific impulse of over 3,000. While this is not as good as the 8,000 seconds of specific impulse produced by the nuclear fission-powered magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, the thrust would be much, much higher. With this faster acceleration, we could get to Mars in as little as one month, instead of the eight months we need for chemical rockets. We would still need about 28% of our ship to be propellant, but we could use this system on the crewed ship only, using the slower but more efficient nuclear electric system to get the tanker and cargo ships on station around Callisto. Then use our fast fusion starship design to get people out to Callisto in around eight months. That's still a long time, but it took Magellan almost three years to circumnavigate the Earth. There will always be explorers willing to make such a journey, to be the first human being on a new world. Without nuclear power, exploration past Mars is just not practical. And even on Mars, nuclear will almost certainly be essential. But all fusion reactors require a tremendous amount of power to get started. And one of the best possible uses of fission power could be providing the energy needed to power a fusion-driven rocket that would open all these other worlds to exploration. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Remember we have Academy theme gear in the Academy store, and there are links in the description. Happy New Year and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.